Okay, today we're going to talk about the periodic table and the elements. The elements are the fundamental building blocks of all matter. Uh, the periodic table is an arrangement, an orderly arrangement of the elements uh, based on what we call atomic number. Now this is a periodic table and you see that the elements here are all represented by symbols. And the symbols can consist of one, two, or in some cases, three letter designations. But regardless, the first letter of every symbol is always capitalized. Okay? And that's going to be important when we talk about formula writing and, and what these formulas look like. Now, there is this dividing line that goes down every periodic table. And what that does is it divides the metals to the left side and the non-metals to the right side. And the most metallic elements are located over here in, in um, uh, the far left of the periodic table. And on the far right, uh, we have our noble gases. Now, as you go left to right across uh, a particular uh, period in the periodic table, you, you have a transition from metallic to non-metallic, and that's the reason these are termed transition metals. These elements 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 are the fundamental building blocks of all matter. Everything we see, feel, touch, don't see, don't feel, air, whatever, they're all made up from fundamental building blocks. And these elements are listed on the periodic table. Now the periodic table is a very well organized source of information once you learn how to quote unquote read it. Um, when you look at various periodic tables, okay, um, there's, there's a lot of variability across where different pieces of information are located. But you have your elemental symbol, let's say we have carbon, okay, um, that's going to be located in the box and we saw our periodic table earlier. Um, but then you'll see a number that increases by one unit as you go across the period. Okay? That's going to be your atomic number or your Z number. And on our periodic table, it just so happens that it's in the upper left-hand corner. So there's our atomic number. Again, sometimes we refer to that as the Z number. The atomic number is the number of protons. Protons are positively charged subatomic particles. Okay? Positively charged subatomic particles. The atomic number positively identifies the element. If you change the number of protons, you change the identity of the element. It's as simple as that. So our protons I know I wrote that twice, so. 
Okay, so we have our elements represented on the periodic table by elemental symbols. The smallest indivisible unit of an element is an atom, meaning that if you have an atom, an atom possesses all the same chemical and physical properties as any other mass of that particular element. It's the smallest mass that still retains the identity of that element. And in the atom, we have subatomic particles, protons, neutrons, and electrons. Here's the protons first, positively charged, um, located in the nucleus. See that? Just a minute. Number of neutrons, these, or I'm sorry, neutrons, these are neutral subatomic particles. Change the number of neutron, neutrons, you get isotopes. Isotopes are different forms of the same element that differ only in mass number. These two are located in the nucleus. The sum total of protons and neutrons represents the mass number. And on our periodic table, here's our mass number. For carbon, it's 12.01. There's our mass number. So the mass number represented on the periodic table is basically the mass of the nucleus. It's basically the mass of the nucleus of the atom. Because in the region surrounding the nucleus, is where the electrons are located. The electrons are negatively charged particles, subatomic particles. negatively charged subatomic particles. They are much smaller than a proton. Pretty close to one two thousandth. It's like one eighteen ninety six. It's a th. <clears throat> okay, electrons are very, very small compared to the other particles that are located in the atom. But despite the size difference between an electron and a proton, their charge magnitudes are the same. In other words, the charge, negative charge on an electron will cancel the positive charge on a proton. So this is located in the region around. The new. The electrons are in the region immediately surrounding the electron. So two of the more important pieces of information on any periodic table are mass numbers and atomic numbers. And different periodicals or different periodic tables can have much more information. Okay? Everybody good so far? <clears throat> now, if we have different isotopes of the same element, um, we can use their relative natural abundance to determine what the mass number is. And you're probably going to have to do that on the exam, so I want to go through a calculation. So 
if we have, let's just take one. Let's calculate the mass. magnesium Remember, isotopes have different mass numbers. They have the same number of protons. If you have three naturally occurring isotopes of magnesium, that means that you all you have three different forms of magnesium that has 12 protons. So periodic table says that it has an atomic number 12. So their relative abundance is Magnesium, in this case, we're putting the mass number in the upper left, atomic number in the bottom, that's the Z number. We're looking at um, 23.9850 atomic mass units at 78.99%. We're looking at 25. Notice I increased my mass number from 24 to 25, but my atomic number is the same, so it's still magnesium. It just has an extra neutron. That's going to be 24.9858 atomic mass units. That's an AMU. 10.00%. And then the last one is 26, 12. Atomic mass number 25.9826 AMU at 11.01%. So, this is actual data on how magnesium exists in nature. So, if you go to the, the magnesium mine and you knock off 100 grams of magnesium and you have it in your hand, you would expect 78.99 grams to, to have a mass, 78% of that to contain atoms that have a mass number of 23.9850. 10% would contain 24.985, and 11.01% would contain this mass number. So there'd be, in that 100 grams, there'd be three different types of magnesium atoms, all with different mass numbers. So how do we get a mass number that we can work with on the periodic table? Well, we simply convert our percentage to a decimal, right? You just take the decimal, we move it over two places, we multiply that fraction times that mass number, and we do that for each of the isotopes, and we add them all up, okay? So if we're looking at I have to erase this because I can only work on this board. We're going to look at 0.7899 times 23.9850 plus 0 0.1000 times 24.9858 0 0.1101 times 0.259826. And we're going to do all of this math. And whatever that number equals, in this case, it would be 24.31. And if we go over and look at our periodic table under magnesium, we see it's 24.31. So, interestingly enough, the mass numbers that are given on the periodic table for each atom of each element 
don't really exist. Right? They don't really exist. They're weighted averages of the naturally occurring isotopes. It's kind of unusual, isn't it? If you go and you look for a magnesium that has a mass number of 24.31 atomic mass units, again, atomic mass unit is just a very, very tiny unit that we use to deal with very, very tiny masses, like a proton or a neutron. If you go in nature and look for 24.31, an atom of magnesium, you won't find it. You won't find it. Okay? We just thought that was kind of weird. Isn't that kind of strange? We're using mass numbers for atoms. Atoms don't exist. Right. I mean, obviously the reason is that the average of anything is better than than any one value. Whenever you take a population, the average is more representative than any um, single value. Okay, <clears throat> you'll have you'll have a question like this on your uh, uh, quiz on Monday. Okay, it won't be magnesium, but it'll be like this. It'll be an element that's only got two isotopes. So if you want to go searching, go ahead. Good luck. Okay. Everybody good with that? Okay. So, <clears throat> we have our subatomic particles in our atoms. Right? We have our nucleus. And in our nucleus, we have only the protons and the electrons. Oh, sorry, protons and the neutrons. So let's take a look at, at sodium, for example. Sodium, let's, sodium has an atomic number of 11, which means it has 11 protons. I can use these. Okay. There's my 11 protons. And it has a mass number of 23.00. And depending on what periodic table you look at, it might say 22.99, 23.00. So, I have my 11 protons. If I have a mass number of 23, how many neutrons do I have? Yeah, does everybody see that? That's 12. Because your mass number, remember, your mass number is only the mass of the nucleus. Okay, which means it's only the mass of the protons and the neutrons. The atomic number gives you the number of protons. So if you subtract the atomic number from the mass number, you get the number of neutrons. The number of neutrons in the nucleus is not given directly on the periodic table. It's not given in the box that contains information on the individual elements. The number of neutrons is not given. In order to determine the number of neutrons, you have to use two pieces of information that are given on the periodic table, the mass number and the atomic number. So in this case, we have 23.00 minus 11, uh, we get 12, right? So this has 12 has 12 neutrons. Now, as you get into the larger, more heavier 
atoms, the ratio gets, gets more skewed. Okay, here it's pretty close. 11 protons, 12 neutrons. And you see that, and you start to begin to think, well, you know, is that the way it always is? I look at oxygen. Oxygen has an atomic number 8, mass number 16. 8 and 8 is, is, the, is the number of neutrons always pretty close to the number of protons. And the answer is yes, for small elements. But larger elements, no. Because, remember, there's positive charges in here. Protons are positively charged. And when you start getting a lot of positive charges all confined to a small region, they start repelling. It destabilizes the nucleus. So the neutrons have to be there to kind of kind of stabilize that positive charge, kind of like a little bit of a coating or a glue that allows those protons to stay in close proximity even though they're positively charged. Okay? Um, but virtually all elements over at atomic number 90 are unstable and they have what we call radioactive isotopes, which means they have to give off some form of radiation to maintain or regain stability. A lot of them are dangerous. Uranium, plutonium, those are the ones that are most famous. Okay? So, in the nucleus, we have the two particles, protons and neutrons, but the neutrons aren't charged. They're neutral. So, if you were to look at a nucleus overall, you'd say it carries an overall net positive charge from the protons. Right? Positive charge. In the region immediately surrounding the nucleus is where we have the electrons. And I'm going to be real simple on this for right now. Because we don't know about what those regions look like that contain those electrons. So I'm looking at sodium. And I capitalize my first letter of my symbol. And I know that sodium has 11 protons. If I put 11, and again, this is grossly oversimplified, they don't look like this. But if I put 11 electrons in the area or region immediately surrounding the sodium, then all the positives in the nucleus would be canceled by the negatives in the region immediately surrounding the nucleus, so I would be overall net neutral. I'd have no charge, right? That makes sense? Makes sense? But if I start removing electrons, and I create an imbalance now between the negatives that are in the region around the nucleus and the positives in the region in the nucleus, if they're not exactly equal, then this element's going to take on a charge as a result of the, the leftover pluses or minuses, whatever it may be. Okay? If you change the number of electrons around a particular atom, you create an ion. You create an ion. These are charged particles. An ion is a charged particle. In our known universe, there's one absolute that you can say. You are either neutral or you are charged. There's nothing in between. Okay? There are things that have maybe partial charges, but they're still charged. You're neutral or you're not. And we have two kinds of ions. We have a cation, which is positive, and we have an anion, which is negative. Now, I always remember that because cation, it's not cation, by the way, it's cation. I always remember it because cation has a little positive right in it. Unfortunately, that doesn't work with electrochemistry because the cathode's not positive. But cation is. We're good. <clears throat> if I were to lose an electron from sodium, now remember, if I have sodium, I have a fixed number of protons, a fixed 
number of positive charges. Because if I change it, I don't have sodium anymore. Right? Protons are things that define the element, or identify it. So I can't change these. I can't change the number of positives. But I can change the number of electrons. Moving electrons around is not rocket science. It's not. If you've ever rubbed a balloon on your head and stuck it on the wall, you moved electrons from it. Okay, it's not a hard thing to do. So now, if I remove an electron, now I have 10 electrons in the region surrounding the nucleus, but I have 11 positives, which means I have one proton that is unpaired, right? And so the atom now takes an overall net charge of plus one. So I write that with a little positive charge in the upper right hand corner of the symbol. A superscript, positive charge. <clears throat> Does everybody see that? Changing the number of electrons creates ions. We're going to see what motivates particular atoms to change the number of electrons. Why do they do it? They're driven that way. Okay? And if I had more electrons than protons, I would be an anion, right? Okay? I think it's important because I think you need to understand where these charges come from. Because we're going to start talking about them pretty quick. And we're going to talk fast. It's a group one element, it's plus one. You need to understand, I, I remember, this is, this is the charge on a, on a particular ion simply has to do with the relative number of protons to the number of electrons. Okay? If your protons are equal to your electrons, you are neutral. You can't move this one, this is protons. If your electrons are greater than protons, you're negative. If your electrons are less than protons, you're positive. Okay? I think everybody says, well, if I have a greater number of electrons, of course I'm positive. Or, I'm, or of course I'm negative, because I have more electrons, right? That makes sense. If I have a number of electrons greater, I'm negative. But to say I have a number of electrons less, I'm positive, that kind of throws people off. So just remember it's the opposite. If I have more negatives than the atomic number, I'm negative. That means if I have less, I must be positive. And I'll try to justify it, which is what I say. Because one of them makes a whole lot of sense to me, one of them doesn't. And that's because we're not used to moving negative charges. Okay? We're not used to, we're not used to saying that if you lose negatives, you go positive. Right? It's not used to it. Everybody good with that? <clears throat> okay? Because we're really going to start talking about some fun stuff now. Okay. All right, let's talk about this region around the nucleus. Let's talk about this. <clears throat> You're talking about electrons around the nucleus of an atom, things that are moving at the speed of light confined to a region that you, you, that you almost need an electron microscope to see. At those parameters, that situation, you could basically say the electrons are pretty much everywhere almost at once. So you don't think about the electrons as, as particles moving in these two-dimensional orbits like the planets around the sun. It's not like that at all. Okay. In fact, it's very difficult to tell where the electrons are. Okay. You can only say with a high degree of probability where you think there's a possibility that they might be. It goes just like that. Okay. Now, I grew up in upstate New York. And <clears throat> on hot nights, these lightning bugs would come out. You know what lightning bugs are on hot summer nights? You know what a lightning bug is? 
high intensity flash, right? You can see them and blink and bleep. And me and my sister used to catch them when I was young and we used to put them in jars, right? And we put lettuce in there or whatever. And invariably they died, unfortunately. But let's say that you catch a lightning bug and you starve the lightning bug for a couple hours. And then you release the lightning bug near a tree where you've put out a lightning bug gourmet dinner because you know what that is. And then you took a time-lapsed photo over the remainder of the night of where that lightning bug might be. You could say with high degree of probability that the lightning bug is going to be somewhere around the food. And you're making that statement because you know that he's hungry. It was a male. Okay? You know that the bug is hungry. And your photo would likely confirm that. You would see periodic light intensities in and around the food. Does that mean you won't see one out here? No, it doesn't mean that at all. It just means that given the current state of hunger, it's unlikely that the lightning bug will be found out there. So you could actually even see a distribution around the food where the lightning bug is. You could make a real good prediction, right? Electrons, they behave the exact same way. You can't tell exactly where they're going to be, but you can define regions where there's a very high probability of finding an electron. And again, just like our lightning bug, it's based on knowledge that we have. Okay? First and foremost, when you're talking about where an electron is around a nucleus, you don't typically state where the electrons reside using normal linear units of distance. In other words, it's not typically stated that the electron around a particular nucleus is located um, uh, one nanometer or two nanometers from the nucleus. These are units of distance. At the subatomic level, we use energy to define distance. And we say, if an electron is closer to the nucleus, it is lower energy and therefore more stable. Electrons located further from the nucleus are higher energy and therefore unstable. So we equate energy to distance. Okay? Now here's the kicker. Only certain values of energy are allowed for electrons. In other words, electrons can only have certain energy values. It's called quantized. And it's called quantum mechanics. I don't know why. I don't care why. It's true though. Right? Now if you have a problem believing that, think about a bottle. Right? You ever blow across the top of a bottle and get a little tune, you know, whatever. If you blow across the top of a bottle containing a fixed volume of liquid, you can only get a certain note or octaves of that note. You can't get a full musical scale. In fact, the only way to change the note or other octaves is to change the level of the liquid in the water in the bottle, right? So could you say under those circumstances, with a fixed volume of water in a bottle, only allowable musical tones are heard? The only allowable ones are possible. Right? I don't really know why, I'm sure there's a reason, but it's true. By analogy, electrons can only have specific energy values. They are quantized. And if they can only have specific defined energy, they can only be located in defined regions because we equate energy to distance. Right? Does that make sense? And it's not difficult to find out, I just happen to have this spectrum chart right here. It's not difficult to find out the energies. This isn't rocket science, right? This is an emission spectra for certain elements. So when you excite an element, uh, an electron, in a certain region, it goes to a higher region. 
And when the element eventually falls back down to its ground state, it gives off the energy that put it up there in the first place. And when it gives off that energy, you can put that through a prism and it will separate out into a series of color spikes. And since we know the wavelength of color, we can calculate the energy of the color spikes. Okay, so it's not terribly easy. Okay? <clears throat> so, what are these regions? Okay, these regions have designations. All right? These regions are called orbitals. Orbitals are regions where there is a high probability are regions where there's a high probability of finding an electron of defined energy or of a specific energy value. The orbital designations are S, P, D, and F. P, D, and F. I doubt you'll ever find it anywhere, but this stands for sharp, principal, diffuse, and fundamental. That'll be one of those who wants to be a millionaire question. Okay? All that is is the characteristic line spectra, emission spectra, of electrons of that specific energy. So S electrons have very sharp spectra, D, P electrons are uh, principal spectra, etc. S, P, D, and F. Yes? What does F stand for? F, fundamental. Diffuse. Diffuse. That's never, you, you're never going to see that on a question anywhere ever. Right? But it's one of those things that you know, people, they never ask. I don't want to know why. Okay? So, how do we determine where these electrons are going to reside? How do we know where they are in, in, in relative location to the nucleus? Okay. In order to, to do that, we need to look at the alpha principle. The alpha The alpha ball principle says, and, and literally alpha ball in German, I don't know much German, but alpha ball means build up or construct. Do you know German? Does it mean, what's it, is it build up or construct? I, I didn't know, I just, I recognized it as German. Oh, it better be. It means build up or construct. And what it says is, is that electrons are, are um, configured around a nucleus. In, in kind of a, a hierarchical order, in an ascending order, okay? Which means they start out close to the nucleus and they fill outward, radially outward. But how do they fill? The alpha principle gives you this. In order to determine how we're gonna fill the electrons, we need to draw the alpha triangle. And to draw the alpha triangle, the first thing we do is we write 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, and you could go to 100. You don't have to. But you're going to go down vertically, and they're all going to be S's. P, 
פי, פי, פי. D, D, D. So you draw, and, and, and it kind of looks like a triangle, right? Now notice that all of the um, vertical columns have the same orbital, S, 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 P, 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 D, 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 F, F. And all the horizontal uh, rows have the same numerical value, 3, 3, 3, 4, 4, 4, 4, 5, 5, 5. I'm now going to draw parallel lines. The first two are going to intersect only one orbital designation each. The next two are going to cut through two orbital designations each. Three. And then lastly, all the way from then on, it would cut through four of them. So I start off by drawing my parallel lines in groups of two. They each cut one, this one here, then that one. Then the next two cut two. Then the next two cut three. Then lastly, they cut four. Okay? Everybody got that so far? Now I'm just going to follow my arrows. I'm going to follow my arrows and I'm going to write down the sequence that I get. By starting here, 1s. Then I go 2s. 2p, 3s. 3p, 4s. 3d, 4p, 5s. I'm going to write that down. This is the order that electrons fill radially outward from the nucleus. The ones, twos, threes, and fours are the period numbers, which we call principal energy levels. The electrons reside in orbitals within principal energy levels. So, principal energy level 1 only has an s orbital. Principal energy level 2 has an s and a p orbital. Okay? Everybody with me so far? <clears throat> so if I look at my nucleus, let's say I have a nucleus right here. Okay? And I have this huge region, this huge distance on a relative scale. This huge, huge distance. And then all of a sudden, I hit principal energy level one. And in principal energy level one, I only have an s orbital. 
Then I have this huge distance again on a relative scale, and then I get principal energy level two. But reasonably close to each other are the two orbitals. Then I have this huge region again, and I get to principal energy level three, where I have an S, P, and D region. Okay? So the principal energy levels are given by the period numbers. Now we'll see how we're going to use this. We'll see how this is all going to make sense now. Now you guys are kind of jumbled around. But now it's all going to come together. If I get right. Okay. The Aufbau principle allows us to write what we call electron configurations. Electron configurations. That's what 1s, 2s, 2p is. Now, there's a maximum number of electrons that can reside in each one of those orbitals. So, we have max electron, we have orbital here, s, p, d, and f, and we have maximum number of electrons. We have 2, 6, 10, and 14. In an s orbital, you can only have two electrons. And incidentally, the s orbitals are known, right? They're spherical in nature. Now, I don't want to get into where and how that is, but it is a mathematical um, result of, of graphing, okay? Um, <coughs> using um, the Schrodinger equation, you can get those structures. An s electron or an s orbital, an s residing in an s or electron residing in an s orbital, travels in a spherical region. It's an s, just kind of spinning around in a sphere. But that sphere is a result of a mathematical calculation. <clears throat> Let's say we want to do sodium. Let's write the electron configuration for sodium. Let's write the electron configuration for sodium. In order to write an electron configuration, what do I need to know? Number of electrons. Number of electrons, of course. How many electrons are there in a neutral sodium? Because I didn't write a charge up here. Let's go to our periodic table. If, it's, if the element is neutral, like I've shown it, how do I determine the number of electrons? What? The number of protons. Protons. That's why we went through all those little drawings, right? In a neutral element, the number of electrons, negatives, equal the number of positives, which are protons. Right? There are 11 protons in sodium, so a neutral sodium has 11 electrons. What I do is write down a segment of my alpha triangle. If I need more, I'll go get it. If I got too much, I'll erase it. I'm just going to write down a segment. Just wrote down a segment. Now, I'm going to show the electrons as a superscript attached to the orbital designation. So, the maximum number of electrons that are in an s orbital is two, so I show every s can have a maximum of two, every p can have a maximum of six, any d can have a maximum of ten, any f can have a maximum of fourteen. And I simply put those in until I reach my determined number of electrons. So I put two in this s, here's an s, how many can it have? Two. 
I have to fill the previous orbital before I go to the next orbital. That's what the alpha ball triangle, that's what the alpha ball principle says. P orbital, what's my max? Six. How many have I accounted for? Six, seven, eight, nine, ten. I've accounted for ten, I only got one more to go. I can put one in the last orbital. I can put less than the maximum in the last orbital. I don't need any more, I got one too many. This is the electron configuration for sodium, and we read it 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s1. Okay? You will have to write electron configurations, for sure. For sure. And electron configurations can help you identify the element as well, right? What if I asked you, what element is this? What neutral element is represented by this electron configuration? You'd say, that's the number of electrons, 11. If it's neutral, then that's the number of protons. Once you have the number of protons, you have the identity of the element. Okay? Everybody see? So far? Okay. Let's do the electron configurations for hydrogen, lithium, sodium, and let's do potassium just for fun. How many electrons for hydrogen? One electron? How about lithium? Three. Three. How about sodium? We just did it. Eleven. Potassium? Nineteen. Yeah, I'm getting those right off the periodic table, right? Right? Lithium? Sodium, we just did it. Potassium? Everybody good? Does anybody notice anything about these electron configurations? Particularly how they end? What do they all end in? More specific. S1. They all end in S1, don't they? Did anyone look on their periodic table and see where those, what group number those elements are in? They're in group number one, aren't they? They're in group number one. You think that's a coincidence? Right? The group number of a particular group of elements tells you the number of valence electrons.
Valence electrons. Valence electrons are outer shell electrons. Valence electrons are the outermost electrons. They're the electrons in the furthest shell from the nucleus. Why would we want to know what the valence electrons look like? Why would we want to know what the configuration of electrons are at the outermost point? Well, think about it. If you bring two things together, where's their first point of contact? It's the outermost regions, right? So if you bring two atoms together during the course of a chemical reaction, their first point of contact is going to be the outermost electrons, the valence electrons. So it's actually the valence electrons that determine many of the chemical and physical properties of each individual element. And since the group members within a particular group have similar outer configurations, they all have common chemical and physical properties. They have similar chemical reactivity. Right? They behave the same because their outermost regions are the same. <coughs> Does everybody see that? If we went to um, magnesium with its 12 electrons, three S2. Now these end in S2, right? And so would all of the members of group two. Notice, <clears throat> what period number is potassium in? Four, right? It's in period four. Remember, we number our periods from top to bottom, one, two, three, four. It's in period four. And what's its valence configuration? 4s1. Start to see how organized this periodic table is. All right. Now remember, valence electrons. The number of valence electrons are given by the group number. So don't just jump automatically to the last orbital. Sometimes it's going to be true, sometimes it's not. Let's take a look at let's say um, oxygen. How many electrons in oxygen? Eight. Remember, I'm, I'm getting the sequence all from this triangle. Remember, so all you have to do is draw that triangle, draw in your, your parallel lines, and write down the sequence. And that's where the sequence comes from. This is the actual order, order of electron filling radially outward from the nucleus. So, 1s2, 2s2, 2p4. That's 8. How many valence electrons? in oxygen. You say four because you automatically jump to the last one, right? But valence electrons are outer shell electrons. What's the highest shell? It's two. So you're obligated to count all of the electrons with a two in front of them. So now how many are there? Six. Six. And what group number is oxygen in? Six, right? It's in six. Don't just jump right to the end. You have to find the highest principal energy level and then add all the electrons within that level. Okay?
everybody with me? Okay. The group numbers tell us a lot. Okay. First, they tell us how many valence electrons we have. How many valence electrons each member in that particular group has. They tell us that members in the same group have similar chemical and physical properties. They also give us clues as to what the most stable form of those particular elements are. Now, there's a difference between an element as it exists in nature and the element in its most stable form. Okay? How an element exists in nature is neutral. It has to be because maintaining a charge takes energy and since the element doesn't have an infinite supply of energy it could never maintain charge for an infinite amount of time. So, elements exist in nature neutral. Their most stable form may or may not be neutral. If it's not neutral, the measure of an element's tendency to go from how it exists in nature to its most stable form is, quite simply, its reactivity. Its reactivity. So, if an element is highly reactive, it means that it exists in nature in an unstable form. And it's highly reactive because it wants to get to its most stable form. Lowest energy, greatest stability. Everything tends toward that. We, even us. Even us. Right? Dig a ditch in 115 degrees, or sit on the couch eating chicken wings watching football. There's a tough one, right? We like low energy, greatest stability as well. We like couch. We like resting. We don't like being out there digging a ditch in 115 degrees, even though it's a dry heat. Okay? Everything is governed by that. Low energy, great stability. They're related. So, group one, let's say for now, just for now, we want to get to eight, or we want to get to zero. Just for now. I'm going to show you in a minute why it's true. But let's say a group one element. A group one element, would it rather give up an electron and go to zero, or take on seven electrons to get to eight? Giving up one electron sounds like the more plausible or more viable alternative, right? Option. If group one elements gave up one electron, what charge would they take? Remember what I said? Yeah, positive, right? Again, don't think about it too much. If you have more electrons, you're negative. So if you have less, you must be positive. But you can justify the more electrons negative, but it's hard to justify the less electrons being positive. So just go with it. If you have one less electron, you're positive one. So, group one, metals, want to lose electrons and be plus one. Group two, want to lose two electrons and be plus two. So, write on your periodic tables, write, write over group one, plus one. Over group two, write plus two. You can see they're already up here, right? There's the plus one, plus two. We already wrote them in on that. Write on your periodic tables. Write under group, group number one. Write plus one. Write above hydrogen. Above beryllium, write plus two. Skip the transition series for now. Go directly to boron. Above it, write plus three. Above carbon, don't write anything because carbon's group four, right? What do you want to do? You want to take on four? You want to give up four? Mm. We'll deal with that later. <coughs> Above nitrogen, write minus three. Above oxygen, write minus two. And above fluorine, write minus one. These are the charges 
that elements in these groups want to take in their most stable form. Let's take a look again. We want to If we want to write or, or write an electron configuration for an element that's carrying a charge, how do we determine the number of electrons? How many electrons in magnesium 2 plus? And it actually is 2 plus, okay? Because the most correct way. like this. We know that we create ions by gaining or losing electrons. In this case, we're losing electrons. But you don't lose them both at once. You lose one, and you lose another. So, the correct way to write magnesium is magnesium plus plus, indicating that it lost one electron, then it lost another one. So, we write it two plus, not plus two. These are the subtle differences. Between, to, between people who understand the fundamentals of, of chemistry and those that don't. It's two plus, not plus two. And you'll see it in books and textbooks. Authors will write plus two. No. So how many electrons in an ion? To determine the number of electrons, we take the atomic number and we subtract the charge. with its sign. So what's the atomic number for magnesium? It's 12. Incidentally, the first page of unit number two, you have to memorize all those elements, symbols and names only. But that's it. That's a small list compared to what's over there. Unit number two, Memorize the first page, the one that has all of the elements, uh, symbols, and names. Those are the only ones you're going to be responsible for. Okay? So in this case, the atomic number for magnesium is 12. The charge is 2 plus 10, uh, 12 minus 2 plus is 10. I have 10 electrons, right? Make sense? So I would do my alpha sequence and I'll put in 10 electrons. How about um, nitrogen with 3 minus? How many electrons? Ten? Nitrogen, three minus, what's the atomic number for nitrogen? Seven. Minus the charge, which is three minus. Minus a negative is adding a positive. 10. Okay? Pretty good? All right. We sure? Okay. Let's do the electron configurations for N3 minus, O2 minus, F minus, neon, sodium, plus, magnesium, 2 plus.
How many electrons? N3 minus. 10. Yeah, we just said it, right? 10 electrons here. How about O2 minus? 10. How about F minus? 10. Neon? 10. Sodium plus? Ten magnesium two plus ten. All of these have ten electrons, which means they all have the same electron configuration. these have the same electron configuration. But only one of them is neutral, isn't it? Which one? Which one's neutral? Neon. If you look on the periodic table, neon is in group 8 which it should be, right? How many valence electrons here? Eight, right? Group A is termed the inert gases or the noble gases. And that's because they're relatively inert, unreactive. Because they have a stable electron configuration. They're unreactive, that means they're happy. Right? If something is, remember, reactivity is a measure of how the thing exists versus how it wants to get to its most stable state. If something is reasonably unreactive, then it's pretty happy in its current state. All other elements want to get to that state. But unfortunately, all other elements have to either gain or lose electrons in order to get to that state. The number of valence electrons in this stable configuration is 8, so the tendency of elements to obtain electron configurations similar to the noble gases is termed the octet rule, because there's 8 electrons. This is the reason why group 1's are plus 1. Remember what sodium looked like? Sodium was 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s1. Sodium plus is 1s2, 2s2, 2p6. It has lost that outer shell electron. And it, and it doesn't mind doing it. Sodium's like, okay, I got a filled one, I got a filled two, and then I got way out in the middle of nowhere, I got a single electron flying around. I don't know where he is, I haven't seen him, bail him out of jail, I don't know what happened to him. It's hard for the, electro, or the element to keep track of that single electron flying around out there. It makes the radius bigger, it increases the overall instability of the atom. So, they put a boot in its butt and get it out. Get rid of it. You're gone. I don't want you. Because if I can get rid of you, I can shrink down, realize a filled outer shell, maximum electrons, 
and I'm nice and stable, I'm going to have myself an electron configuration similar to neon, and I'm happy with that. So, the group 1 is being plus 1, group 2 is being plus 2, group 3 is being plus 3. This is all driven by the octet rule. Trying to obtain this stable outer shell configuration. Even though they're relatively unreactive from the electron standpoint, they're still carrying charges, which makes them somewhat reactive. Okay? Does everybody see that? See why they're plus one? And in the next unit, we're going to have to know. Magnesium's two plus because I'm going to form, form a, 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 a compound with, between magnesium and chlorine. Right? And you're going to have to know why and how. All right? There is a shorthand version to writing electron configurations. And it's, it's, it's pretty straightforward. Let's say that we wanted to write the configuration for bromine. This is a big one. Bromine, at, let's do chlorine instead, 17. Chlorine, 17 electrons. Again, the whole key to all this is this, right? I mean, that's the key. Once you know this sequence, you're good to go. You can write any electron configuration you want. And you don't have to memorize the sequence because you can always derive it by writing the triangle. So I'm going to write down a segment. Two, two, six, two, six. Oops, that's 18. Five. That's 17. Can you verify that the outer shell contains 7? Do you see the 7? And chlorine is in fact in group 7? See the relationships? It's all very well organized. Just got to learn to read it. The preceding noble gas the chlorine is neon. So what happens in the shorthand version is we put the preceding noble gas in brackets and we simply write the remaining orbital designations. What it says is the electron configuration of neon plus 3s2, 3p5. That's what this says. I'm not a huge fan of this, but I understand why they do it. On periodic tables, you have small um, um, spaces. And if you want to put the electron configurations in there, you can't, you can't write these whole things out. So I understand it and agree with it, but I'm not a big fan. See that? So if we have the element, we have the atomic number, we can write the electron configuration. And this is probably how you see them on the exams, because just sheer typing and sheer space, you'll have these abbreviated forms. There's also another way to represent electrons, and that is using an orbital diagram. Now, orbital diagrams are a little bit more exact in showing the locations of the electrons. And orbital diagrams are easily obtained from electron configurations. So, let's go back to our old friend sodium. 11 electrons. 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s1. 11. 
the orbital diagrams the orbit now you can it depends on what book you're using or you know how um, you know the author approaches it whatever but orbital diagrams can be represented using squares um, circles or even in some cases just a single line um, in this case the orbitals are labeled and instead of the electrons be repre uh, represented using exponents they're represented by arrows pointing in opposite directions now the arrows pointing in opposite directions mean that these electrons have different spins one is spinning clockwise, the other is spinning counterclockwise. There's no correlation to up being clockwise or counterclockwise. It's just up and down, that means one's going this way, one's going that way. Okay? Electrons are explicitly identified using a set of quantum numbers, which we're not going to get into. And, 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 and electrons can have identical quantum numbers, except they have to have opposite spins. And this is what happens when they're in the same region. Remember, electrons are negatively charged. They don't like each other. They repel. So they don't like being confined in the same region. 2s would look like this. Now, each box can only contain two electrons. So, if I go to 2p and I have six electrons, how many boxes do I need? Three. Three. Here's my 2p. Now, I have to put one electron in each box pointing in the same direction before I can go back and pair them. That's called Hun's rule. That's Hun's rule. And, and I, I have a better analogy. Okay? Electrons are negatively charged, so they don't like to be in the same room. So if you have a couple of kids that are fighting, right? It doesn't matter how far apart you put them in the same room. They're still going to be fighting. But if you put them in separate rooms, they can be separated by... 12 inches of a wall and everybody's good. That's what you're doing here. You're putting electrons in different regions of the p orbital. It's px, py, and pz. So you got the orbitals in the, in the y plane, the z plane, and the x plane. And that's what these are. You're putting one in this one, one in this one, and one in this one before you go back through and you pair them up in any one of those or orbitals. And then lastly, we have the 3s, which looks like that. This is the orbital diagram for sodium. Don't mix up conventions, okay? You can't do this. You can't have 1s2 and then have a box. This is electron configuration. This is orbital. Okay. How about, just remember, electron configurations, 1s, 2s, 2p, orbital, you're going to have the boxes. Do the orbital diagram for nitrogen. Let's do the orbital diagram for nitrogen. How many electrons? 
So, seven, thank you. I'm going to have one S, right? There's two. I'm going to have two S. There's two, that counts for four. Then I'm going to have my two P, right? That's nitrogen. Not this. You can't do this. You will not pair up electrons if you have an empty region. You're going to put one in each region, and the arrows have to be pointing in the same direction. It doesn't matter if they're all up or all down. It doesn't matter. They have to be pointing in the same direction. Okay? Again, Hun's rule. Okay? These are called parallel spins versus paired spins in para. Okay, you're going to have some questions on the exam on electron configuration and orbital diagrams. For sure. For sure. Okay, <clears throat> lastly, valence electrons. We know that they're outermost or outer shell. And this is going to kind of lead us in to the next chapter. Sir Lewis. Lewis diagrams. Lewis diagrams show only valence electrons. That's it. Only valence electrons. So I'm going to go across period number two. Let's do lithium, beryllium, boron, carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, chlorine, neon. Now, I want to show the number of valence electrons for each one of these elements. I imagine the element as having four sides. Lithium is in group number what? One. So it's got one valence electron. So I'm going to show that as a dot around the symbol. It doesn't matter where you put it, but there's only one side of the element that has a dot on it. Again, imagine that it's four-sided. Okay? Beryllium, group number two. I'm going to maintain symmetry. I'm going to put one on each side, just because I think it looks nice. Boron has three. Carbon has four. Now that I've got a dot on each of the four sides, I can now think about pairing up. Nitrogen has five, right? One, two, three, four, five. Don't develop any bad habits. Do it this way. Put a dot on each side, then pair it up. Oxygen is six. One, two, three, four, five, six. Fluorine is seven. Neon is eight. See how I get those dots? <clears throat> See where those Lewis dots come from? Just straight from the group number. The periodic table has so much information on it. We're going to use this later, okay? Because every place there's a single dot, that's a potential bond. Every place there's two dots, they're called lone pairs, you're not going to have bonding. So nitrogen wants to form three bonds, has one lone pair. Carbon wants to form four bonds. Oxygen wants to form two bonds with two lone pairs. This is how we're going to determine our molecular geometry at the end of the next chapter. Okay, we're going to have to know 
what happens when I have three bonds and one lone pair? What happens when I have two bonds and two lone pairs? This is where it comes from. It all comes from the group number on the periodic table. Okay? Questions? 